So we get to the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate can also initiate a bill. If they want to initiate it, a member of the Senate will simply present it on the Senate floor rather than dropping it in a hopper. If they take it up, then the Vice President of the United States, currently Joe Biden, he's also President of the Senate, and he will assign committees to it just like it would be assigned to committees in the House. Um, once it goes to the committees in the Senate, it then comes up for debate. Now here's how debates work in the Senate. In the Senate, there are no time limits. So if you're against the bill, you might just decide to eat up as much time as you can. Senators started doing this, I mean this goes all the way back to the 19th century. Back then it was rarely used, but if someone was just adamantly opposed to the bill, and they thought it was so terrible it would just ruin America, then they would, as a last ditch effort, they'd get up there and they would debate, debate, they'd talk it to death. They'd stand up there and they'd talk about why they hate the bill. Then maybe they would pick up the Bible and start reading. Maybe they would read from the phone book or read poetry. But they would do anything just to eat up time and hope that the other side eventually gives up. Uh, usually these efforts would ultimately fail. The longest single-person filibuster on record is held by Strom Thurmond. He actually passed away a few years ago. He's one of the longest-serving members of the Senate. He was filibustering the 1957 Civil Rights Act, and he filibustered for 24 hours and 18 minutes. That is one guy that did not want to see racial integration. He actually ran for president a few times on that platform. So that's the longest filibuster on record, a filibuster against a bill to promote civil rights. Doesn't that just make you proud? So, that's how the filibuster works. It, here's how you get past the filibuster. You need 60 votes to force an end to the debate. The 60 votes is called cloture. Now there are only 50, I'm sorry, there are only 100 members of the Senate, which means to pass a bill you need 50 senators plus the vice president to break the tie, or more than 50 senators to vote yes on it. However, to force a bill to even come to a vote, you need 60. So, in the old days, a filibuster was used once in a while. They became more frequent, however, after the election of George W. Bush. His election was very controversial. Many Democrats did not consider him to be the rightful president. You can look into the 2000 election further if you want, but a lot of people thought the election was stolen. So the Democrats started obstructing everything. They started filibustering everything they could. And eventually, the Republicans threatened to use what's called the nuclear option. This is another way around the filibuster. If you don't have the 60 votes, um, if you have 50 and you have the vice president, you can pull this off. And the way it works is one of the senators makes a motion. Mr. Vice President, I make a motion that the filibuster is unconstitutional because according to the U.S. Constitution, only 50 votes plus the Vice President are needed to pass a bill, and the filibuster requires 60. The Vice President then agrees and says, I agree, it is unconstitutional. The filibuster is stricken from the Senate rules. The only thing you can do at that point if you want to keep the filibuster is you can appeal it. But you won't have the numbers, you won't have the votes, so your appeal will be unsuccessful, and that ends the filibuster. It can't be used at least for the rest of that Congress. you probably need another election if it ever comes back. Now, the nuclear option has never been used. It's only been threatened. And Dick Cheney threatened to use it. And the Democrats and some moderate Republicans got together. They didn't want the filibuster to end, so they cut a deal. They cut a deal that the Democrats would promise only to filibuster major pieces of legislation, uh, budget issues, if the Republicans promised not to nuke the filibuster. Uh, the Democrats and the Republicans kept their word, at least through the rest of George W. Bush's presidency. Uh, the Democrats only filibustered budget issues from that point onward, and the Republicans did not nuke it. However, there's another maneuver you can pull. In order to get Bush's second round of tax cuts passed, now tax cuts are a budget issue, so the Democrats, surely enough, filibustered that. This is where the reconciliation maneuver comes in. Dick Cheney decided this time what he would do is he would cut a few deals to get the votes he needed, get enough moderate Democrats to swing his way, 
And once he got their votes, here's what you do next. One version has passed through the House of Representatives. The version in the Senate does not match the House of Representatives, so you can't just send it to the President. Both chambers have to vote on the same version. Now, if you pass a different version through the Senate, the House could just approve that. That, by the way, is how we got the health care bill that was passed back in 2010. But what can also happen is it can go to a reconciliation committee. A reconciliation committee will be made up of senators and House representatives. And their goal is to draw up a final version that both the House and the Senate can agree upon. Now, according to the Senate rules, once it goes through reconciliation, there is no debate. If there is no debate, there's no filibuster. If there's no filibuster, then you only need 50 votes plus the vice president, or more than 50. So, what Dick Cheney did was he cut a deal, and he got enough votes to get a version that didn't match the House. He sent it to Reconciliation Committee, and he pulled enough strings to get them to put right back in those particular aspects of the tax cut that was holding it up, and then he just rammed it right through the Senate. This time there was no filibuster, so he got it passed that way. That's the reconciliation maneuver. It was used by Dick Cheney. It has never been used by Obama and Joe Biden so far, though they've talked about it before. They talked about doing that with the health care bill in order to get a public option. Um, that was unsuccessful, however, because a lot of Democrats said, if you do that, we'll vote no on it. A lot of Democrats did not want to do exactly what the Republicans did five or six years ago. And so the filibuster, since Obama has been elected, has been used for every single vote. I am not exaggerating. Every single vote. Every single one has had to go through a cloture vote to end the debate. Because there's always somebody who wants to hold it up. There's always somebody who wants to filibuster. And sometimes the bills they filibuster you wouldn't believe. The Republicans actually filibustered a bill to rename a post office the Ronald Reagan Post Office. They were simply filibustering everything. Absolutely everything. So, in this day and age, to pass a bill, it's as simple as that. You need 60, not 50. You need 60 senators, because you'll never get past a filibuster without it. The only way this can end is if we found a way to just end the filibuster, because at this point, they are so obstructionist that they will use any and all tactics to stop a bill that they're against, or actually even a bill that they're in favor, but they don't want the other party to pass it. And so... In the House, all you need is a simple majority, but in the Senate, in reality, you need 60 senators. Now, once it passes through the House and through the Senate, it goes to the President for signature or veto. This brings us to the health care bill. Obama could have vetoed the health care bill. A lot of you are thinking, why would he do that? Well, in 2008, President Obama made a campaign promise. He promised that he would not sign into law a health care bill unless it contained a public option. Obama decided not to keep that promise. He decided, I guess, that some health care bill is better than no health care bill, so he signed it into law. Had Obama vetoed it, however, it could have been overturned by two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate. I guarantee you there's not two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate that would have done that, but... That would be the procedure. So if the president vetoes a bill, that's how you overturn the president. Now there's one more procedure I want to talk about. If the bill completely passes, but you still don't like it, if you can make an argument that it's unconstitutional, you can then go to the other branch of government, the judiciary. You sue the government for violating our constitutional rights. This is what happened with Obama's health care bill. Led by Attorney General Bill McCollum, the former Attorney General of Florida, opponents of the bill argued that the federal government has no authority to force the purchase of health insurance. And essentially this bill is you must buy health insurance or else pay a tax. Well, it worked its way up the courts and eventually when it got to the Supreme Court, five of the nine judges ruled that the government does have the authority because you simply pay a tax if you don't get health insurance, and therefore it's simply a tax, and taxes are constitutional. That was their ruling. You don't have to agree with it, but that was their ruling. 
But because it was a 5-4 ruling, that is 5 voted yes, 4 voted no, that makes it rather controversial. Because it looks like, well, the Supreme Court doesn't seem to be all that certain. One thing to remember about the Supreme Court is they are not supposed to be a political branch. That is, they're not supposed to have policy agendas. Their job is simply to interpret the Constitution. So theoretically, when you're writing a law in Congress, you need to make sure it adheres to the Constitution or else it could be challenged in the federal courts. And if it gets stricken down in the federal courts, then you have a new legal precedent. It's now understood that these kinds of laws are unconstitutional. It certainly happened many times before, but Obama's health care bill did hold up in court, albeit barely. So that's the whole process beginning to end. If you are one of my students, I want you to know that this is one of my favorite exam questions. So I want you to go over this as many times as you need to. Thank you guys for tuning in to my not-for-profit educational channel. Uh, this is Professor Wag signing off.